Now then, crew, and welcome back to the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel. Now, in the midst of all the various projects that are going on at the moment and waiting for parts so we can get those projects finished, I went to go and see Jared at Forge up in Auckland, and he said, Hey, Andy, I've got a problem with my strimmer or weed whacker or weed eater, whatever you call them in your neck of the woods. And he has a Ryobi petrol-powered weed whacker strimmer destroyer thing that he uses for you know around his garden and he said about it for years and he said i was just doing the edging on the lawns you know having it you know right up in the air something like that was like that so it's quite vertical and he said it just stopped just working fine and then just stopped and he said he said, didn't think it was fuel there was still plenty of fuel in it and he came to restart the engines. It started a little bit and then it wouldn't start again. And the pull cord now is completely seized solid. So I said to him, hey, first thing you could do is pull the pull cord off and see if you can turn the crankshaft. It might be a problem in the pull cord itself, in the mechanism, that where the two little, uses some little weights that get thrown out and they jam onto like a ratchet system to engage it into the crankshaft. So it drives it, take it off, eliminate that. If you still can't, can't turn the crankshaft, then I think we've potentially got an engine seizure problem. Why? I have no idea at this point in time. It's a pre-mix, so it puts the two-stroke oil in with the petrol, so there's no possibility of a little two-stroke pump failing to operate and then not lubricating the engine, which would obviously cause a seizure. Um, but if it's getting fuel, it's also getting the oil. And he also double checked that the ratio of two stroke oil he was putting in 50 to one uh, was correct for this particular model. So it's none of those things. So we have a little autopsy to do. We're gonna pull the thing apart. It's 18 years old. It probably isn't gonna get fixed, but we need to find out just for interest, really why it failed. Was it the big end bearing that failed on it? Was it the piston to bore seizure? I don't know. Only one way to find out. Here we go. <laughs> Used. diagnostics we need to replicate the customer complaint so let's pull on the pull cord and see if the engine turns over jeez Gah. right absolutely see solid nothing wants to rotate whatsoever there's a bit of springiness going on but definitely nothing turning over right let's get that pull cord mechanism taken off and we'll start digging into it here we go Oh, it's bloody cold today, it really is. Right, one. Two. Now these things have big, usually have big springs inside, which is what retracts the, 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 the flex of the cord back into the drum. So, <laughs> I don't know what Jared's been doing. It might explode on me into a million pieces. So, here we go. Oh no, anti-climax as always. There we go, look. Okay. So obviously as that rotates, these lock in onto these little ratchets just here, look. So the pull cord mechanism itself is working just fine. No problems at all with that. So the problem is... Oh, that's interesting. So we have got some movement of the crankshaft but it seems to be locked after about 90, maybe 100 degrees of rotation. Interesting. So I was thinking, maybe because we've got some movement of the crankshaft, and normally when they're seized, they're seized solid and doesn't want to move at all, maybe it's something to do with the output down to the head. Maybe something in the shaft has seized or jammed. So let's flick it around without taking the lights out and see if we can rotate the head. We can. Now there may be 
a centrifugal clutch between the output to the head and the output from the crankshaft. So that only when you rev it does the head start to turn. I don't know, I've not pulled a manual off the internet for this. It's a bit of an adventure. So we can turn that, so I think we can discount the fact that everything in this shaft leading up to the engine is working fine. Okay, so we're going to pull the engine apart. And I think the first thing to do is to remove the fuel tank. Let's get that out of the way. By the looks of it, same size bolts again, or screws, whatever you want to call them. Super job. Not really a small engine repair person, to be honest, but it's not often I turn away a good autopsy. It looks like this machine hasn't been stripped from day one. The screws have still, the bolts have still got their thread lock on them, and they are still quite tight to get out. The fuel tank feeds the carb via this little pipe just here, and there is a second pipe actually as well, which runs down the back of this plastic. Now there is some fuel leaking, Jared tells me that the little bulb here for priming the carb uh, has you know, it started to leak. So whenever you prime the carb up you get a little bit of fuel coming out as well, which is not ideal. So let's just pull this cover off. I imagine in here will be the air filter. Then we can get to those pipes nice and easy. Oh, there we go, look. Right, air filter looks intact, although tiny. Right, we're going to get a bit of fuel leakage now. Okay, let's see if we can get it off at the tank. Or does it go inside the tank? It does. Okay, so we're going to pull them off the actual carbon itself. And there's some little metal clips on there as well. Oh, nearly. <laughs> I imagine that these pipes are going to die, actually, because they're quite old. Flat screwdriver, I think. Always fun getting these off. There we go. Look, there's one. Now, this other one goes to the bulb. So, how am I going to disconnect that? Can you see? You can see. So it's this one here we need to pull off. Oh, that was easy, wasn't it? Okay, so we can get the fuel tank out of the way now. Hardly any fuel in it, which is good to know. Okay, we can get rid of the greenery. And notice that that was blocking quite a lot of the cooling area. Keep the engine cool. Hmm. Right, next job. Let's get the rest of this plastic shrouding taken off. Slightly smaller size on the Torx bits, so we'll just swap that out. There we go, it's a good little tool this actually, makes things a lot quicker. And that, they're already out, so there shouldn't be too many more. There's another one, look. And one more in there, look. This one's been crushed. Evidence that maybe somebody has been in here before. Who knows? Right, that's that cover off. Chuck it in the box. And then I think we're going to have to separate the actual shaft from the engine. So that's these two. Or actually. Yes, because we've got some wiring going on, so we want to disconnect all of that. So we're going to have to, we're going to, have to separate this whole piece here. Right. We know where it is, it's on the floor. Right. Way! Holy crap, that's going to be fun putting that together. Okay, put the screws in that bit. 
this looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Jared. Right, we'll take that off there. There we go. Get rid of the trigger. So all we've got now is a wire, so we can disconnect the shaft. And to do that, by the looks of it, we've got a screw, a normal posi screw, and we've got a larger, is that the same size as that? Oh, it is. Right. Bear with me then. Let's get that swapped across again. Here we go. Right, and that one had a nut on the far side, so do we need to remove all of that? We need a screwdriver, bear with me. Okay. Okay, uh, can we push that bolt through with the screwdriver? We can. Excellent, now can we disconnect that? from the head. Yes. Super job. Right, we'll stick that out of the way. Pop it up over there. All that stuff, geez, it's good to go. The problem lies in here. Yes, we've still got that 100, 100 odd degree turn and lock. So let's get the rest of the plastic cowling taken off. Then we can really get into the engine. I hope, it's, I hope I can remember how all this goes back together, honestly. Okay, so we can disconnect some of this because we've just got a connection there. We'll stop things flapping around. Oh, it's got a zip tie in it, hang on. Just trying to cut down the bits flapping around so it doesn't affect the camera too much. We'll get rid of that. Pulling this to zip tie out, and then we can disconnect the switch. There we go, look. On off button. Super job. Okay, I think we're back down to the small one now. We are. Now, it's done a lot of work as this little uh, line strewer. It's done very well, says Jared. Whether it's going to get repaired or not is a whole different ball game because they're pretty cheap to buy anyway. Which I would say about $180. And parts are normally A, very hard to get hold of, and B, usually quite expensive compared to the cost of the, replacing the whole unit. There we go. Any more? I think that's all of them. Right, let's see if we can get that, that rubber cap off. Mr. Spark plug, that is. I see that is the actual plug cap. Interesting. Okay, will that come off without that? Or is there another screw? No, I think we're there. <laughs> come on, you can do it! What's it caught on? Oh, I see. It goes around this. Oh, there's a metal plate. Okay. I think we need to take the carburetor off first to get rid of that heat shield. That's going to be fun. How the hell do we get the carb off? Okay. Is it the same size as those? I think so. Jeez, look at the length of that. One, two, interesting. Okay. Right, we've got another pipe to disconnect and we've got that little, looks like a part of the choke mechanism there, look. Okay. Or, can we just pull the, there we are, look, we'll just do that. That works. 
and that must be into there look right so we can snip that zip tie and separate that get rid of the carb and now we can get to these screws here and get that little manifold taken off there we go to camera mr young to camera Super, right, we've got that off. Now we should be able to get the heat shield out, which is preventing that. Oh, it's even screwed to it, that's why. Okay, that might all come off in one piece now. He says, yes, there we go, look. Super. Now, the wire. Oh, they don't make it easy, do they? Okay. Centrifugal clutch, excellent. So when the engine's just idling, it doesn't drive the head. That's what I thought was the case. Okay, so we've got to undo that screw to get... Oh, look at that. The earth wire here has rubbed through on the casing. Just exposing the wires. Can you see that there? It shows the age of the machine, doesn't it? Way nearly. God. So we'll just whiz that off. Right. I'm going to stick that back in there for now. And we've got one more wire which you can't really see. There we are, look. Which is that little terminal there. Brilliant. All of that can go. And that's the that's the drum inside there that that centrifugal clutch basically. Uh, locks onto when the engine RPM increases and the weights get thrown out, the shoes get thrown out. So all that's good. Okay. So here we have the engine. Well, all that happened pretty damn quickly and we're right down to this little tiny engine. It weighs nothing. So the problem must be somewhere in there that's causing that crankshaft to, to not fully rotate. So we're actually getting a slightly more movement now, which is a bit bizarre. But you can see on the end there, look, the weights that would get thrown out to transmit the drive down to the head. They all look fine. Ooh, listen. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Ooh, that doesn't sound good at all. Okay, let's dig our way in and find the carnage. Here we go. Right, what's next? Well, I'd like to get the ignition system taken off. And to do that, oh, there we go, look, we can pull that off the car, off the spark plug. And now we can take up, now this is, a, this is the coil that creates the spark, and it's directly induced off the flywheel. See the little pickups down here, look. So, change that head across. Put the, oh, the big one was on. What a muppet. Okay, let's pull that off there. One, two, now we should be able to get rid of that. Jesus, spaces and all sorts, isn't there? Where do they all go? Right, little plastic spacers, washers, golly gosh. Okay, ignition system is out of the way. Let's get rid of the exhaust system now, which isn't a lot. I say system in the loosest possible sense. That's one. Two. Cool, that's that bit done. It's getting smaller by the second, isn't it? Okay, now, next job, I think, is going to be taking the cylinder, the cylinder off the top. So let's remove the spark plug first whilst we can still hold on to it. Well, this is an 18mm spark plug socket, and that doesn't fit. So this is a 19mm socket, and that does. We'll use that. You ready? Oh, that was not tight. That was not tight at all. Jeez. Okay, well, it's still got a gap on the spark plug. If you can see that there, look. There you go. Right, cylinder head off. Bit of a close up, I think. I do like the fact that everything is the same size bolt. That's 
one two right that's a heat shield that's now gone right now the head bolts you get access through these two holes here look so we need something pretty long to get down there we're going to try to find some kind of extension bar so i can uh, i can get down to these bolts Jeez, we're getting with that yes just only just okay let's see if this is going to work it might it might not God, it's a tight fit well we're on oh, it hasn't got enough beans oh no what we're gonna do right plan f okay can you see only just right I'm going in Jeez, that's one. We'll just crack them off with a ratchet. Everything's very small, isn't it? Right, we'll get rid of that. Plug that back on. Fantastic. Now we should see the piston as we pull the cylinder off. If we can get the cylinder off. Oh, there we go. Holy moly. This thing, honestly, weighs absolutely nothing. Wow. Okay, we'll take a closer look at that shortly. What does the piston look like? Well, it's been modified. Let's take a closer look. Oh, it's not... Oh no, look at that. So we've got some big chunks missing out of the piston itself. Tiny little piston, by the way. And it also feels, oh, it feels very loose on the big end as well. Very, very floppy indeed. Look at that, look at the play on that big end. Knock, 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 knock. So we've got both big end failure and the piston was, well, it obviously lost compression and it was pretty much seized in the cylinder itself and that's what was causing it to, to not to rotate i'm sure if we turn the crankshaft now yes it rotates full 360. right well let's keep going but we'll have a little look at the cylinder first where's that other bolt is he going to come out he is there we are look right so let's turn the turn the torch on and take a look there we go. So what can we see down the hole of darkness? Now notice on this that the cylinder head, this bit, the end of the cylinder, right down there, it's all one piece. There is no head gasket as such. It's just one complete, you know, casting that's been machined out, which is, I suppose, makes it really cheap to make and it's less components and, you know, there's no head gasket to fail. Actually quite clever, really, isn't it? And I suppose on small engines they can do that. So what's the bore like? Is the bore all scored as well? So how does it look? You can see the ports where the mixture enters the cylinder look. Wow. Those are the transfer ports you can see up the sides. Well, that one there's got a bit of a chunk out of it. I'm trying to get the torch so it can do its own thing. So down there, we've got a chunk just out, just out of the cylinder itself. This is all aluminium, by the way. Well, it might be a steel insert, but I think, I think it's just aluminium, to be honest. What else can we see? Very difficult to get the torch angle just right for you. Too busy looking on the camera and not looking down the cylinder myself. Yeah, the bore hasn't been that badly affected at all, honesty. The big, although saying that, if you look down the bottom, if you can see that or not, there's a bit of debris. Hang on, let's try and get this camera sorted out for you. Is that going to work? Oh, it's a bit better, isn't it? So if you look down there, 
we've got, let's see if we can get it to focus for you on that bit. There. Right down the bottom, we've got, oh yes, a bit of debris. So if I get rid of that. There, look. That was a bit of engine at one point, and it isn't anymore. It's just a little bit of shrapnel. There, look. Not good. So that was always probably off one of the piston rings, just starting to break up. But there's quite clear evidence of impacts around the head. That bit that broke off has been smacking. Oh, there you are, look. From the top of the piston, the piston crown, here we've got evidence of all sorts of bits of metal embedded in the top of the piston so bits of steel i imagine stuck in the bit of, in, the, in the actual piston itself and you know they've obviously also caused problems down here and there's a bit that's obviously got stuck down the side of the bore between the piston and the bore itself and has caused all this damage now, is the pist are the piston rings in intact? They are. That one's all right. So is the pins... Ah, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Right. So can you see here, on two-stroke pistons, we have little tiny dowels in the piston to keep the piston rings in exactly the right place because we have to do that because of the ports... That are, in, that are machined into the cylinder itself. If those piston rings rotate and an end of a piston ring lines up with a port, then it'll spring out and it'll smack against the actual cylinder itself and, and destroy itself. On this side here, it looks like that piston has moved, the ring, sorry, has moved slightly. And I think that is the pin. And as you can see, the ring's a bit further round. This is usually where I let the blood out of one of my fingers, unfortunately. Um, let's get the piston taken off, and then that way it's a bit easier to hold. So we can... I'll go and get a pick. Hang on, I need a pick. Right, so we should be able to pick out one of these little circlips. Assuming it has circlips, it should have. Yes, there we go. Look, right, you ready? It's going to fire across the workshop. You should never reuse them anyway. Oh, there we are. It didn't quite fire across the workshop. Right, that is the little circlet that holds the gudgeon pin in place. So now, I should, with the screwdriver, not the pick, be able to push the, yes, the pin through. Let's try and get it on camera for you. Jeez, I don't want to come out. Let's try getting rid of this this circlip on this side. There we go. We'll try pushing it back this way. It might require some. Oh, there we go. God, that's tight. Right, hammer and a punch. Now, bearing in mind the crankshaft, or should I say the the conrod at least, and the big end bearing are completely shot, so we're not too concerned about following procedure on this. Right, that might be enough. Yes. There we go. So we've separated the piston from the conrod now. And that's the little end. The little end doesn't look too bad, actually. There's no signs, because this is where the bearing is that goes into the little end bearing. We'll, we'll take a closer look at that a bit later on, but the actual pin itself doesn't show any signs of poor lubrication. Interesting. Okay, so going back to these pins for the piston rings. Now I've got my pick. Let's see if we can just get piston ring off. Way. Half a piston ring. Okay, that's fine. We knew it wasn't broke before I only got hold of it. Okay, there we go. And yes, it snapped at this point here. So we've got one little bit left in there. Now, obviously, this piston is scrap. My fingers aren't scrap at the moment. There we go. Right, so where is that pin? Where's the dowel? Is that the dowel? I think it is. 
Yes, there we go, look. So the ring had moved around. Part of that dowel is actually missing. It's not as prominent. If I get this ring taken off, you'll see. Oh, oh God. They're not in very good condition, these rings, are they? Another bit of ring. Right. There we go. So if we reverse round, bits of aluminium stuck in there. If we come round, you'll see, yes, the the, uh, the lower piston ring pin, if you can see that on there, look, is quite prominent and it's, it's intact. And if we come round to this one, it looks like it's pushed further in, which has allowed the ring to migrate round. Now, I'm not saying that's the reason for the failure, but it was certainly in the wrong place. But the piston, the end of the piston ring wasn't that far off from where it should have been. But it is quite important that they're held in the right place. And there's definitely been some debris working its way between the piston and the cylinder wall, because that's where you get this kind of scoring from here. This is quite, a, this, in fact, this is incredibly bad, this bit. I've got another another very deep groove just coming down here as well, haven't we? And that might have been the reason why Jared couldn't get the uh, the engine to turn over on the pull cord, is because the piston was jammed in the cylinder. Right, that's enough of the piston. We've had a look down the bore. Let's have a little look at the big end. I say big end in the lightest, loosest sense because it's actually very small. But we call this the big end, that's this one here, and we call this one the little end. And the little end, oh look at that, you can even take the bearing out, look. Right. Little baby needler roller bearing, which is still intact, which is good. Well done little needler roller bearing. But the, I can't say quite the same about the big end, look. That's quite badly worn. That would have been knocking for some time with that. Listen. Shouldn't do that. Okay, let's see if we can disassemble this a little bit further and get the crankshaft out. But I think we found the problem. Now, this centrifugal clutch mechanism has to come off first before we can remove, I suppose, what you would call the flywheel. Now, We've got here, you can see that the big spring in the middle, as this speeds up, these weights and the brake shoe here get thrown out. The friction material gets thrown out, and that's what grabs onto the drum to transmit drive down to the head of the tool. Now, these look like they're going to be a bit awkward to get out, but we'll give it a go. Oh, wrong way. Oh, Jesus. All right, that's one. Okay, we've got a little spring washer on there as well. And then we've got this one to do. Right, you ready? Watch out for the vibrations again. There we go. Excellent. Ooh, and some more washers. There's a lot of washers on these things, isn't there? That's weird how there's only one of those. Yeah. Oh, I see, it's probably come from, there's the one. Right, two washers. And this is the mechanism. It's got the little arrows on there for direction and stuff, which is cool. I don't think this is going to go back together, though. Okay, now, is that a 14? It's not. We need a smaller socket. Right, is it a 12? It is a 12. Excellent. Okay, here we go. It is. And it wasn't very tight. Okay, one nut. Now the question is, is that just going to come off? And the answer is no. And I imagine there'll be a puller in the Ryobi Special Tools Kit. There'll be a puller that bolts to here and has the puller centre that goes against the crankshaft to pull that flywheel off. I don't have one. But I do have a normal claw puller. Now with this being an aluminium flywheel, very bad idea, but Given the fact that this thing is now scrap, because it's definitely not worth, not worth fixing, I can use a normal puller just to hock onto there and get that flywheel taken off, hopefully. Right, one puller to 
to do this, I think the best idea is pop it in the vise, and we'll just uh, clamp around there. It's got aluminium jaws in there, so it shouldn't cause too much harm. And we won't go all gorilla. I just want to just nip it up so I can get the puller on, put on at the top. A bit easier. There we go. That should just about do. Hopefully. Right. Three arm, three leg puller. One, two. Ooh, we need to come around a little bit. Can we do that? Jeez. Let's try it just around there. Ooh, it's going to be touch and go. There. Right, let's give that a go. Okay. Just checking everything first. It's all a little bit to cock, to be fair, but that's really the only way I can get on this. Now this isn't the way you'd normally do it, you should really have the proper puller because we're going to be putting force on the outside of the flywheel and it's only aluminium and it may well deform, it might crack, it might break, but it's okay, this is scrap. Given the amount of damage on this thing, it's not worth fixing. It's just an autopsy. So feel free to go mad in the comments if you want. And yes, I could make something up, but in all honesty, I haven't got time for that. So we should hear a sudden loud crack as that flywheel pops off the taper. Or it breaks. Ooh, what was that? There we go. Oh no, I was correct. <laughs> We've broken the flywheel. <laughs> there you go. Like I told you, they're not very strong. So if you were doing this repair at home and uh, you were hoping to use the old flywheel, then you wouldn't be able to. You'd bugger it, basically. And that's why it's important that you use the right pullers. Okay, so the next job is where do we go from here? Can we, can we shock it off? Another little trick that we can use because it's scrap is we can just basically hit the end of the crankshaft and hopefully shock it off. Um, Again, you wouldn't be able to do that if you were planning on rebuilding this, but just for the exercise of delving in and pulling something apart, then you can sort of get away with it. It's not ideal. Okay, well, where's me hammer? Hammer and me punch again, I think. One hammer, one punch. It's not in the vise very strong, so it's probably going to fall out of the vise. In fact, let's just, let's just rest it on top like that I can hold it and I'll give it a little give it a little tap and see what happens there we go easy it's on a little conical taper so you know as soon as it starts to move it just falls off and I mean the puller might have helped us a little bit but of course <laughs> we destroyed the flywheel sorry Jared <laughs> Over pint. Okay, with that flywheel now off, we can get to the three bolts that hold the two crankcase halves together. We're nearly there, people. We really are. Right, back to the other bench. So close. Has this got enough beans? Oh, it doesn't have enough beans. Okay. Right, we will crack those off manually and then we'll buzz them out. Oh, actually, it's quite tight all the way down. Let me change tools. Hang on. Right, a few more beans. Here we go. That's one. Plenty of thread lock on that one. Two. Last one. Three. Super job. Right. Well, here we go separating the crankcases. If it all goes to plan, it should be. There we are. Look at the size of that tiny little crankshaft. Almost there. There's the gasket lock. Get rid of that. <laughs> What's left of it? Don't need that anymore. Where's my hammer? Give him a little tap. Remember, this is scrap, so it doesn't matter. Oh, 
Oh, I know what's going wrong. We've left the key in. God damn, rookie mistake. Right, there you go, look. If you're gonna do this at home, wait for it. <coughs> Jesus. Right, take out the Woodruff key first. Those pliers. What a donkey. There we are. This is the thing that you will always lose. Every single time. There we are, look. Came out a lot easier that time, didn't it? So, in the crankcase itself is what we call the main bearings. And that actually feels pretty good. And you can see the oil. There's definitely lubrication in there. So that wasn't an issue. That wasn't part of the failure. Now, how the hell are we going to get that off there? I want to get the crankshaft out. How is that held on there? Is that a screw? I have no idea how that's held on there. Is it just screwed onto the crank? I think it is. That is a thread. I think if we hold that in the vise, the crankshaft, we should be able to turn that and unscrew it. Yes, let's give that a go. Luckily, aluminium jaws. Not that it makes a lot of difference on this particular crankshaft, to be fair, but anyway. Right, so we'll clamp that in there. And I think, can I get some grips? I think this is just screwed straight onto the crankshaft. Only one way to find out. Oh, look at that, so easy. Okay, so we can unscrew that now. There we go, a bit of thread lock, can't go wrong. And again, these are those little spring-loaded ratchet pieces. And they're working fine. And now we can remove the other crankcase. And oh, this bearings looks a bit, a bit like it's got a bit hotter, a bit more grime in there for sure. Is there any play? No, there's no play. So it definitely wasn't a big, uh, a, a main bearing failure. Right, one crankshaft. Beautiful. I can see that being a paperweight for Jared at work. Well, isn't it amazing how it doesn't take long to pull something like this apart? So we'll get rid of those crankshaft bolts, uh, crankcase bolts. So, crankshaft. This was the flywheel side with the woodruff key. And this was the side that basically the little mechanism for the, uh, the pull cord connects to. And it's, all it is is just threaded straight onto the crankshaft. Very neat and simple. And I mean, to be fair, it works. There's not particularly a lot of force on it. And this stuff is all is all old thread lock where they've locked it in place. Because of course there's a bit of vibration going on with these engines. But what's interesting to look at now, and it's the last thing to check really, or to look at properly, is the actual uh, big end bearing. The main bearings sit on either side of the crankshaft. Here look. And the Big end bearing is what connects the conrod, this little tiny thing here, and the piston, as we saw earlier on, goes on the end there, look. And the job of the conrod is to convert a linear motion up and down on the cylinder to a rotary motion. Pretty cool, isn't it? Good old mechanics. Now, I must admit, the casting quality of this conrod is absolutely atrocious can you see and this hasn't broken off this is just poor casting there's a big chunk of the conrod missing here where there hasn't been enough material put into the into the die or however however they made it in there and there's also another great chunk <laughs> just missing on this side here look look at that it hasn't broken off that's just the way it came out of the factory absolutely horrific really you know if you saw that in a motorcycle engine or a car engine it would just be a joke but anyway it's got way too much movement up and down that would have been knock 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 for quite some time and that additional movement would have reduced the clearance from the piston crown to the cylinder head 
Now, I'm not saying that's why there's bits of metal in there. Uh, I think that's all down to a different reason. But if that had failed much more, if this bearing, the little needle roller bearing inside there had started to break up, then I think we'd have easily seen uh, the piston itself make contact with the cylinder head, or the top of the cylinder in this case. But, um, yeah, poor little engine, honestly. That kind of movement's not that important, but it really is horrific. You wouldn't normally see that, and I think that's uh, exasperated by the fact that the conrod is so narrow on that bearing. All done for cheapness. But hey, it lasted 18 years, and I'll say that again, it lasted 18 years of Jared using it, which is testament to Ryobi. It's just hung in there. It's done a great job. But in the end, it failed, and I think it failed because that piston ring migrated. It moved away from the original dowel, uh, which is the top one there. Looks so we've got one dowel here, which was good, and that piston ring stayed put. And then on the other one, the dowel, either a bit of the dowel's broken off, or it's been, somehow it's got, maybe in the factory, it's not been fitted quite in the right place. And Anyway, in any case, the piston ring was definitely offset by about, I don't know, 5 or 10 mil. I'll have to check the video now. Uh, and then it got caught, and then basically little bits of debris just started to get trapped between the cylinder and the piston. And of course, very quickly you get the demise. And I think the reason why it had locked up is because a bit of that debris was, was preventing the piston from moving. And we did get some movement, didn't we? We got, I think, about 100 degrees of rotational movement on the crankshaft. Uh, and then after sort of wiggling it around a bit, then we got full travel. So, most bizarre, it was mechanically jammed due to shrapnel in the cylinder. And probably down to just old age, really. It had just had enough. It had gone up and down the cylinder one, many, one too many times. There you go. Quite a cool little adventure, actually, pulling that apart. I've never repaired one of these weed whackers or strimmers before. Um, pulled a couple apart over the years and similar small engines. Very cool that it's still a two-stroke engine. They're getting pretty much, you know, wiped out these days on modern stuff. But little two-strokes lend themselves really well to things like this. Chainsaw engines, weed whackers and stuff because their power to weight ratio is much better than the traditional four-stroke which has a lot more components, you know, valves and timing chains or push rods and that kind of stuff. So, Jared, I am sorry, mate. It's scrap. It's not going to get fixed. It's too far gone. And in all honesty, when I when I took the the, the trigger mechanism off, off the actual shaft, and it all just fell apart and springs popped out and stuff, I tend not to get on too well with those anyway. So I thought, hmm, hopefully I want to put this thing back together. Um, it's not worth buying parts. We'd need to get a new cylinder because it is slightly scored in there. We'd need to get a new piston. We'd need a new, where is it? Where's the paperweight gone? Where is he? There he is. Tiny little thing. We'd need to get a new crankshaft for it. Whilst you're on, you put new main bearings in. I know, that, I know there's nothing wrong with them, but whilst you're in, you'd change them. Uh, you need a new little end bearing. You need gaskets, piston rings, spark plug, air filter. It's just not worth doing. These, these are, in all honesty, are designed as a disposable component, a disposable unit. When it fails, oh, and you'd need a new flywheel, which would be pretty expensive because it's got the little pickups for the coil in there, the magnets, which, you know, it's not going to be cheap. And I broke that, but that's all right, because at that point in time, I decided it wasn't going to get fixed anyway. It wasn't in the world. Uh, I could have made up a puller, but I didn't because I don't want to spend the time on it. Um, but there you go. Interesting stuff. And, and now Jared can hang this up in his office or put it on his desk. As a reminder, that things don't last forever. It did really well, but it's never going to last forever. It'll also remind us about the really bad casting quality of Ryobi. But it lasted. Okay, crew, well, hopefully you found this video fun, interesting, helpful, informative. Call it what you like. I do like pulling things apart and finding out why they failed. And I think the failure was down to the piston ring just migrating around on that pin. Now, of course, once it goes over the pin, the pin actually forces it against the wall of the cylinder a little bit. And then, it, of course, you know, it can start to bind up and score and that kind of stuff. Because it, the ring can't sit fully into the groove anymore on the piston so 
it's just a matter of time before the whole thing fails. Why did it move over there? I don't know. I just don't know. I wasn't there when it happened. Um, did it have anything to do with the uses that Jared was putting it to at the time? You know, with having having the, the machine almost vertical, sort of edging the lawn with it? I don't think so. I think it was going to happen regardless. I don't think it was down to usage. Um, as regards lubrication, you know, I mean, the the um, the little end of the gudgeon pin here, the little pin that connects the or piston pin, depending where you're from in this world, um, that's nice and smooth. And usually if there's poor lubrication going on, then that will start to get scored pretty quickly. And it's not scored. Um, the main bearings are all good. Again, the mains will start to suffer if there's poor lubrication. So I think the damage to the piston was called, but caused by a mechanical failure of that piston ring migrating. And then the reason why I couldn't start the machine is there was pieces of metal jamming the piston to the bore and of course it wouldn't rotate because the, the gearing on the pull cord is quite high. You know, you do one full pull and this goes up and down many, many, many times on one pull. So it doesn't take a lot of resistance in the cylinder to equal a lot of resistance at the pull cord itself. And I think that's what we saw. Okay, enough of a summary. Uh, why not subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, you'll get notifications as and when I upload any new videos. Don't forget there's a live stream every Sunday morning. Uh, that's New Zealand time, 8.30 a.m. Feel free to join in, ask questions. Uh, you know, there's quite a, quite a big crowd now that comes down and there's plenty of banter going on. Um, and we also do a New Zealand pie review, which has got nothing to do with engines at all, but mechanics do eat pies, so has some relevance. You'll also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and my email address is down the bottom in the description. So feel free to communicate through any of those portals. If you do email me, then I do respond, usually. It takes a bit of time sometimes, but it's me that writes those emails. There's nobody else, it's just me. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can do that through Patreon or PayPal. Uh, and there are links on the YouTube channel where you'll find those. Um, with PayPal, it's the same email address again. If you can't afford to support the channel uh, and you can't pledge financially, don't worry, it's not a problem. Uh, some do, not all do, obviously. Um, but uh, you can also, if you want to support us, why not uh, you know, choose a video, whether it's this one or one of the other 550 on the channel, uh, and share it on your social media, you know, so that all your mates get to know about the channel, because they might watch a few. Okay, crew, well... It's about, yes, it's about time for me to go. I'll see you next time. Cheers. I'll run out. And we get the up again. Oh. Ha <laughs> ha